Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 554. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you're listening on the 2nd of December, 2019. Okay, it's Monday morning. You're going to see us yawn anyway, but I'm just going to let you know I'm back from vacation. George is finishing up his stint in St. Bart's, and so he's uh, his brain's going to be ending mode here where he's going to transition back to Florida. Gavin, uh, people are going to say, is that France? Is that England? Where, where are you now? <laughs> uh, it's, it's the middle of England uh, between an Islamic assassination and a general election. Mm-hmm. So everything is very febrile here at the moment, and um, in- England it is. Sure. So let's get started by letting the audience know what you can do to help. Please subscribe to this show. If you're not subscribed, you do that on YouTube. You click on that little rectangle red subscribe button and boom, a bell pops up. You want to click the bell. If you click the bell, you get an instant notification on your browser that, oh, lo and behold, Anglican Unscripted has uploaded another video and you want to watch us. We know you do. Uh, Please share the program with your friends, your enemies, whoever you want to share it with. Uh, if you see us on Facebook, you see us on YouTube, click that little thumbs up. It lets the algorithms know that this is a popular episode and it should feed it to more and more people, thus growing the audience, which we want to do because, well, we don't want to sit here and drink coffee and talk. Well, we would do that anyway. We just sat and had a wonderful hour pre-show talking about things guys talk about who are theologians and uh, travelers and uh, and Gavin the whole time was eating lunch right in front of us, and that's what we do for a pre-show. <laughs> it was amazing. So, Kevin, I'd, I'd like. Can I say that? Um, great. First of all, I'm very grateful for the comments that are made, most of which we try and answer. But mm-hmm. from time to time, I get people writing to me, which actually really quite regularly. And one of the things that people say is they're very grateful indeed for what for this for this show i think i'm very grateful for it (laughs) um but i can see that that gratitude is shared really quite widely by 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 a lot of people for whom it's a handhold in the in these turbulent theological and cultural times and uh, i just want to say thank you for writing and and it's it's very nice to know you're out there (laughs) because otherwise we we don't have much sense of who's out there but um uh it is extraordinary how many marvelous and interesting and and good christian people there are who are fellow travelers for this show well george we could have a separate show every week just on our mailbag i have a uh, uh, mail today from a, a lutheran pastor who watches us and has some suggestions on content i got uh uh, we have our favorite Mormons who watch us. It, it, it's interesting to see that the reach this show has over um, each episode. Yes, this past week I got an email from an Irish Dominican priest telling me about an incident happening in his county where a Church of Ireland rector had dismissed an organist after the organist got married in a same-sex wedding and how the Irish Times was savaging this poor rector for upholding the church's teaching. And on one level it was sort of a local story but on i think for me what struck me most was sort of the ecumenical imperative that though we may have our differences of doctrine and denomination uh people are recognizing across uh, the traditional boundaries that organized faithful christianity of whatever stripe is under attack and we really need to hold together in this time Mm -hmm. and not beat each other up for for not subscribing to this or subscribing to that. So it really is encouraging to me in a sense of the scope of people. Yes, we get people who are really fascinated by the intricacies of Anglican life, but then we have people, as you mentioned, who are not Anglicans who really don't care and ask us to explain what the ACNA means or the AAC means, but who come to this because they find a sense of Christian reflection that they're not otherwise getting in their lives. And that's very and, encouraging. Well, and the biggest thing we get when we travel is people meet us. You're just like you are on TV. Well, <laughs> we are. I mean, this is WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. Gavin is Gavin. George is George. And Kevin is Kevin. And uh, same with the, all the people we interview and, and have on the program throughout the year. 
this is just who we are. And I try to find authentic people uh, for the show who can uh, crack a smile and give you great news and be transparent uh, about what's happening in the church. Another, uh, do you have, you can add something, George. Well, and we also get corrections. Uh, some mm-hmm. of them are, are bona fide corrections. Others are times when we have to sort of relook at what was said. Right. For instance, uh, the Bishop of Willisden, uh, Gavin, Pete Broadbent. Uh, mm-hmm. We had a story about Jan Ozan, or Jane Ozan being, inv- being included in the Archbishop of Canterbury's party uh, to visit the Pope. And Pete Broadbent said, that's absolutely untrue, and you people need to retract that. And I went to the author who broke the original story, and he said, uh, no, I stand by my story. People have said it's untrue, but I stand by it. Now, so in this case, I have no firsthand knowledge, but it really is fascinating to see how this Anglican unscripted can work correctly by bringing things out there, and if we're wrong, uh, for instance, a mistake, I said that uh, uh, Foley Beach was the chairman or, uh, of the Global South. I may have said that, or, but instead he's the treasurer. Or I said he was the vice chairman and he's the treasurer. Those sorts of things are easy to correct. But when we get stories uh, wrong, as, as alleged by Pete Broadbent, it's nice to be able to go back and check them and come back and say, I can't tell you if it's wrong or right because the original author of the story stands by what he wrote. When I was first a blogger with the Connecticut Six blog decades ago, we can go back, I guess, uh, 2005, 2006, 2007, I made an erroneous report on a story. And uh, people were calling me out and stuff like that. And I was freaking out. Oh, my gosh. I have screwed up. I, my reputation is sought. I, uh, it's all over. And I, was, uh, I wrote an email at the time to a, a fellow blogger, Kendall Harmon, uh, Titus 1-9. And he goes, Kevin, I, I, you don't understand this yet. He goes, the Internet is self-correcting. You, you, if you make a mistake, the internet is there to help you out and and fix it for you, and that's exactly what happened. I mean, uh, we put these sort of stories out, and when we are wrong, there's uh, offers of correction or clarification uh, to be more accurate, and we we really enjoy that about uh, running Anglican unscripted. Uh, I'd, like st- go, I'd like to go back to the Wilsden thing just for a second before oh, we sure. lose it because mm-hmm. it's 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 very important. Um, it's undoubtedly it's true that on a technicality, the Archbishop of Canterbury didn't arrange for Jane Ozan to meet the Pope. He didn't. She got somebody she met over coffee the day before to make the arrangement to get her an invited to his private mass. But what was interesting was the fact that Pete Broadbent was so very concerned to break the association in public between Welby and Ozan. But the fact is the association was there. She had accompanied him to the meeting. She wouldn't have had access to the Pope at that time and place if she hadn't been part of Welby's entourage. And what they were trying to do was to was to put some distance between Ozan and Welby that there is not, in fact. I mean, there is a very close proximity between what she stands for and his private sympathies which is why Wilsden didn't want that link made. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, weeks later, there's only one thing we're talking about. It's not that Welby met with Pro Francis. It's that Ozan was there handing out her book. And, you know, that's why you want to make that disassociation. Oh, we got nothing to do with that. No, no, you have something to do with that. Uh, it, it couldn't have happened yes. without you. And that's a sad fact. You need to be careful about what you're doing in public. And that's why you know the, the New Testament calls for you to be above reproach uh, in, in so many different aspects because people are watching. And um, that kind of brings us to our next topic, uh, transparency. Uh, I always judge things whether or not they're redeemable. I could hear the worst story about something within the church or one of my friends or colleagues or something happening and I go, how can God be glorified in this? Is this redeemable? You know, it, it, can there be salvation at the end of the day? Um, can there be repentance and a return to the church? And this next story we're going to talk about is exactly that, uh, because it's a horrible story. It involves something that happened with the, in the ACNA at a cathedral. I'll have George give you the details. Um, but it's so such a horrible story, yet 
it's a, a shining light on the ACNA in doing something the right way, very transparently. Uh, can you tell the people, George, about uh, the the, uh, the Eric Dudley story? Well, Eric Dudley was the dean of uh, of the cathedral. I want to call it St. Paul's, uh, St. Peter's, excuse Peter's, me. Yeah. Huh? St. Peter's Cathedral in Tallahassee, Florida, which is the cathedral church of the Diocese of the Gulf Atlantic. Eric was one of the high flyers, the stars of the ACNA. He had a congregation over a thousand. He's a charismatic speak preacher. He just on the outside was the ideal uh, figure for the ACNA in the future, bringing people across across denominational lines to Jesus Christ. And this turned out to be the ACNA's Jonathan Fletcher story of one of the figureheads, the leaders of the conservative evangelical movement had a dark inner inside. And just as Fletcher has been accused of grooming young men for homoerotic games and whatnot, so Eric Dudley uh, was, has been accused of doing the same sorts of things. Now, the sto that some Dudley uh, had young men curates in their 20s and early 30s and these men all had, were of a type, meaning some di they didn't have fathers, or they, they were men who needed a father type figure in their lives at that time. And Dudley filled that void plus sexualized it in a very perverted way. Now, some complaints were raised to the bishop of the diocese, and initially the bishop, according to this report, said, let's not talk about it. He issued godly admonitions to be quiet. Then he said, well, we can take care of this in-house. Well, kudos for the bishop, Neil Labar, to realize, no, that's not going to work. And they hired an independent entity to do a full and complete investigation. They spent the money to do it right. And this, I think it's 72-page report, which was released by the interim uh, rector, Archbishop Bob Duncan, lays out in great detail, detail Dudley's misconduct and the church's response. And it's horrible that this happened. But I've had people who were involved in the Fletcher crisis, Fletcher abuse uh, crisis in the Church of England, and they're on the liberal side of the spectrum. They don't carry any water for the ACNA. Yet they are saying the ACNA can be a model for the Church of England in dealing with things like the Fletcher crisis. Neil Labar, the bishop, realized that for credibility's sake, he could not be both investigator, judge, and jury, and prosecutor. It had to be done independently where the people testify. Well, let's say you're a young priest and something untoward happened to you. You really are not gonna wanna talk about this openly to some priest appointed by the bishop or your bishop, because essentially your career's over. You may have been the victim, but you're going to be tarred for the rest of your life, some people would fear, with, you know, that stigma. Yeah. And allowing this to be independent, and, and not just writing down what people say, but investigating it. Can this accusation be verified? Can that, you know, so hundreds and thousands of documents, of emails, of calendars, of over 51 witness testimonies were all taken in this. And this report paints a very nasty picture of Eric Dudley. But the bigger picture is, just like in the case that Eric McNeese had out in the Diocese of San Joaquin, where you had a pervert priest, the ACNA has been doing it right in having absolute, complete transparency. So bravo to Neil Labar, bravo to Eric McNeese and his uh, situation. Yes, it's terrible, but the ACNA has is modeling godly behavior in the face of evil. And it's an also awesome, you know, that there's an organization like this that you can go to that can provide an independent investigation uh, to some very horrible uh, character flaws, uh, and you know, can make a horrible situation redeemable. Because we need to pray for the. Okay, go on, George. I was just saying, the same week as the Dudley report came out, we had the Church of England announce finally, after so many years, they're going to investigate the claims put forward by Matthew Innocent, uh, who was molested by a priest of the Church of England. And Innocent 
went to five bishops, including the Archbishop of York, with this story and testified before the independent tribunal and Justin Welby was in the same room and Justin Welby refused to take responsibility, to do anything, even to apologize. And it, the Innocent Review is being run by the church, by people picked by the church, who are going to report to the church, who are given their authority by the church, and the church is going to decide what it's going to say and not going to say. And Innocent has said, I can't cooperate with this because it's a stitch up from the very beginning. They're going to find what has been predetermined to be found right now so that Justin Welby and Johnson Tamu are not tarred and they'll just dump it all on some... It's, it's too bad George Bell was never up in that part of the country because otherwise George Bell would be made the victim of the innocent uh, scandal. Uh, so if you get a chance, it's a hard read. It's on Anglican.inc if you want to read the report. Um, if you don't want to read it, that's fine too. But uh, please pray for the victims. Uh, pray for the situation. And if you get a chance to thank Neil Labar and uh, uh, show appreciation to the ACNA, this is a great opportunity. Um, Gavin, I want to move over to some news uh, that's happening in the, in the Church of England and England. First, another terrorist attack. And this is a, an amazing story at the press level because it uh, hits a topic that uh, we've talked about before where the left does not know how to forgive. And we can kind of hit that up at the end of the story here. But uh, give us a quick update on the terrorist attack on the London Bridge and what's transpired. I think there are two issues that might, and uh, not entertain is the wrong word, that might um, demand our attention. Mm -hmm. um, one is the issue of radicalization and whether someone can be de-radicalized. But more immediately, if you watch the videos that came out, you see three very brave men chasing the Islamic terrorist who's just murdered two people. Uh, one of them has a, a, a narwhal tusk and the other a fire extinguisher. But there's a third man. And mm -hmm. before the police killed the terrorist, they had to pull off a man who was uh, trying to, to beat him up uh, and, rest and restrain him. And it turns well, out the man they pulled off the last minute. We're going to use the word minute, subdue. They, they, he was trying to subdue him with great the word. Th physical Thank force. You. Yes, <laughs> I shouldn't say beat him up. I mean, uh, but he was trying to subdue him, and quite rightly too. But the man they pulled off and they couldn't get away from this subduing exercise was called James Ford. And for a few hours, everyone said, what an incredibly brave and wonderfully marvelous hero. He'd been at the seminar for reintegrating uh, prisoners. But it turned out that he was a murderer. And tragically, he killed a 21-year-old woman called Amanda, who had a mental age of 15 and was serving the appropriate sentence. But he was there as an offender who was being rehabilitated. And the difficulty the press had was, here was a man who behaved quite heroically and unselfishly, but who was also a murderer. And there is no way in which our post-Christian culture that people understand how to manage redemption. There isn't even a scale of, of, of righteousness and unrighteousness by which people make some kind of conclusion. Um, and we have got so caught up with guilt by association or elements of public guilt that some people appear to be redeemable. And although this man was immensely brave, the press have gone completely quiet on him because it doesn't know how to deal with him. The other issue is the whole program of, re, of, of radicalization and de-radicalization. There is, of course, in Islam, a doctrine of deception. Muhammad enjoins on Muslims to practice deception. It's ever to their advantage. And, and the terrorist in question had written letters saying he wanted to be rehabilitated in society. He was now a good Englishman. He'd given up radical Islam. Uh, he wrote letters to thank people for buying him computer equipment and thank them from the bottom of his heart in words that were very um, moving and impressive. But it all turns out to have been a complete charade until the moment came when he could wreak Islamic havoc on bystanders. And what we find is that the press and the public find it almost impossible to believe that de-radicalization can't take place. 
they they assume that there must be a, a route into normal society from uh, devoted Muslims who've decided that violence is the proper way. And so we have a situation where people won't tell the truth, won't recognize the truth, refuse to uh, equate themselves with the basic facts of Islamic th theology. And we find ourselves living in kind of Alice through the looking glass land where where words where they mean what they mean and people can't accept reality as it presents them to, to themselves. We, we are having a sort of mass psychosis within the press and within public response. It's hard because in, in redemption, we know that Christ can redeem us and that we can see a, um, a de-radicalization with a life in Christ. But in the secular terms, I don't see I, or any examples of a person who's turned away from radical Islam and returned to general English society. I don't see any examples of that. George? Well, there are three. Sorry, George, go ahead. Okay. I, I can't answer your question, Kevin, as to reformed uh, radical uh, people, but I have read articles by those by people in that mm -hmm. worldview. So I, I won't say never, but I'm just don't have them at the tip of my tongue. What I was I was going to mention, basically, a cultural difference is that the difference. If this had happened on the Brooklyn Bridge versus happening on the London Bridge, the difference would have been that this man would not have been alive by the time the police got there. The culture in Britain is run away. Uh, don't uh, confront evil, you know, just allow the appropriate forces to get there. Uh, and in the United States, well, I, let me just take my part of the world in the United States, uh, it would have been solved if you had uh, by the people on the scene and then the police would have gotten there. Yeah. And, the, and if they had killed the man, they would not have been arrested for murder or charged with anything. Whereas in England, you read these stories about uh, men uh, killing a burglar in the act of robbing their home and they're sent up to prison for murder, for killing uh, a burglar. It's Maybe it's a cultural thing, I don't know, or uh, the society in which we live right now. Well, here in America, we have what's called the Castle Doctrine. You're allowed to protect where you live and in, in your car and stuff like that. And they take it a little further in Florida, you, you know, the castle doctrine down there. But you're allowed you're allowed to use an appropriate level of violence of in response yeah. to violence. So right. if somebody's been killing people, you have if you're on the scene and you're involved in that situation, and there's no premeditation involved, uh, you can respond with an equal level of violence to prevent further people from being killed. Do they have that in England or Europe? Yeah. We used to, we certainly used to have it, but mm -hmm. we've lost it. And I think it's one of the examples of the way in which power and responsibility is shifting from the individual to the state. Uh, the state refuses to allow individuals to play their part in the struggle between good and evil, uh, even to the point of defending yourself. Mm -hmm. So George is quite right. One of the reasons why justice wasn't taken into the hands of the people who were subduing the man was because we're trained day after day, week after week, not to take responsibility as individuals, but to devolve it to the state. And of course, the state behaves very badly and incompetently, as it always does. You said incompetence. What a great tr transitional word we could use here. I need to talk t to you guys, or have you guys talked to me about the Church of England and abortion? Uh, uh, never have two topics uh, deserved each other so much. Um, Gavin, what's the latest news over there? It's very hard to find the right words, Kevin. I'm I'm so distressed, uh, angry, disgusted. I, um, once you've seen what abortion is, what, once you've seen what happens to the children, once you've seen what happens to the mothers and the way in which it's never healed, uh, um, once one has a theological understanding uh, of mothers destroying their own children and of a society destroying its own progeny, a kind of cultural, and biological and familial suicide almost. Uh, I, I'm entirely with people who want to give part of their lives to demonstrating outside abortion clinics. So very recently we had the Archbishop of Canterbury asked 
whether or not he approved of those buffer zones which stop people being there outside clinics offering prayers and a form of witness against this ghastly um, form of murder that takes place on an industrial scale. And the Archbishop of Canterbury took the side of the people who want buffer zones to, to get rid of Christian witness. But then very bravely recently, a young clergyman asked for signatories to a letter encouraging uh, Christians not to vote for, in particular, the left, who are bringing in full-term abortion. I mean, that is up, up, up to the moment of birth, you can destroy the child. And uh, some, some splendid people added their names in hundreds to this letter, which was published by the Times, which is our kind of basic bulletin board for things that matter. And the Church of England bishops remained completely and wholly and utterly silent with the one exception of the Anglo-Catholic Society bishops, who to their credit uh, um, made some kind of small protest, but it was a pretty domestic one. <laughs> and, and the idea that the English bishops, presumably, I have to say, terrified of their feminist colleagues, who are all pro-choice in, in a high-octane way, have been frightened into the most immoral silence on this matter so much so that if i th think if one was to say of all of all episcopal and ecclesiastical and institutional immorality for a church in a century what what a, what is the, the top of the list of immorality i, I would say it was this issue well, for the church to be. to be unable to speak out about it for the bishops to be completely neutered is is disgusting here the candidates for the democrat uh Democratic uh, primaries, uh, all except for maybe one, support full-term uh, abortion rights, meaning that you could be murdered in the womb on your birthday if you weren't born in time on that day. Um, it 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 just it's so unfathomable to that we're dealing with this in 2019, and um, I think this is going to continue. But it's it's the new rallying cry of the left that. Uh, abortion on demand when we want it no apologies and the af after the uh, letter was published in the times the bishop of carlisle gavin uh bishop newsom gavin newsom's the governor of california uh, but his name last name is newsom the bishop of carlisle james. and the bishop james newsom, yes. james yeah, yeah, james newsom yeah. and the bishop of uh, uh newcastle uh it's a woman whose name escapes me published a response to the Church of England's website uh, saying, oh yes, uh, we, we do stand by, the Church of England does stand by its official positions on abortion, but we normally don't get involved in politics. And what this response was, was and it, as I view it, is it's an admission of the utter collapse of leadership under Justin Welby of the House of Bishops. They had the Church of England's lead bishop on healthcare, Newsom, plus a woman bishop, to give it a woman's touch, write a very milquetoast agreement to this letter of the times. Now, we rem I can remember when Rowan Williams would write, in 2005, wrote an opinion piece in the, in the times, basically stating his opposition to abortion. And nobody could ever claim Rowan Williams was not a feminist in the support of women, the women's issues. Yet, he was very outspoken in his uh, abhorrence of abortion. And the Church of England does have a stance and position on this. And it took the lower level clergy to get the bishops to do their duty. Now that is as much of an embarrassment. If I were a bishop, I would be, basically, I couldn't show my face in public because I have been shown up to be inconsequential, incompetent, and slight and foolish by the people whom I'm supposed to be leading. In other words, the, the Church of England once again is, <laughs> they said this about the British army in the First World War, uh, lions led by donkeys. The Church of England are lions, in many cases are lions led by donkeys. The utter incompetence of the well model of manager, uh, bishop, of bishop, uh, bishops selected for race, for gender, for uh, demographic balancing, rather than for the charism of episcopacy, you're seeing it played out here. 
I mean, what's the point of the episcopacy in the Church of England? Really, what is the point when you when you've reached this level that they have to be shamed into doing the right thing, their own and upholding their own standards? Another great transitional piece here, shamed into doing doing the right thing. Um, Chief Rabbi wrote a letter saying anti-Semitism here in, in England is gone rampant, and we can't vote it into office. Forcing uh, what I say a, a, a response from the Church of England. George, do you know the story? Yes, uh, Mervis. I forget his first name. Uh, his last name is Mervis. Really? Uh, I'm sorry, my brain is on vacation. Still. That's right. it's fine. He Mine issued, still is. <laughs> he issued essentially an unprecedented public attack on the Labour Party leadership under Jeremy Corbyn and the Liberal Democrats for their, well, in Corbyn's case, for unreconstructed, good old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. the, that the uh, Jews control the world banking, the Rothschilds behind everything, just good old-fashioned, der Sturmer, Nazi era, seeing Jews behind every evil act in the world. Uh, I don't want to jump on uh, Jeremy Corbyn and his persona in politics. I'm not English, it's not my business. But if I were Jewish, I would be very, very concerned that this man has even a chance of being made prime minister. I mean, uh, I know one or two English uh, Jew, in, Jews who live in England, and they're talking now, at least the two I've spoken with, seriously, it's time to get out. It's time to either go to Israel or maybe the United States, but we cannot raise our grandchildren in this country anymore if Jeremy Corbyn is the future. I have a uh, friend who's a from my, my law faculty days. Uh, we studied law together. Actually, she was great. She wiped the floor with me in a moot when I was 21. <laughs> and quite rightly, she's become a senior judge. And I haven't. She was she worked very hard. Uh, we met the other day. She's Jewish. And she said, Gavin, we're thinking of leaving, should we? A and the answer has to be that the climate in England has become so dangerous for Jews. The other day, a Jewish rabbi was walking in North London, I think two nights ago, and a group of hooded youths shouted the worst kind of obscenities, which I won't repeat, and beat him up very badly. He was uh, helped in a, in, in a hospital and then immediately put on a plane back to Israel. We live in a very dangerous, dark and dangerous time, and I'm afraid I, I think it's about Islam. I mean, there is a degree, of course, of horrible right-wing anti-Semitism, as always had been from the septic and poisonous far right. Insofar as they exist, I don't think they're as large as the left pretend that they are. But the real anti-Semitism comes from the left in the name of Islam, in the name of Palestinian rights, and in the name of a, of a political momentum that wants to destroy or approves of destroying Israel. Because the whole uninformed redistribution of power from the strong to the weak has persuaded them that Islam is weak and Israel is strong and therefore Israel should be destroyed and all our sympathy should be with the Palestinians. I think most sane people would want to distribute their sympathy between Israelis and Palestinians, recognizing that Israel foreign policy has sometimes been profoundly mistaken and that Palestinian aggression has been unquenchable and, and, and in, is insolvable. But the idea again that our European culture can swing so swiftly behind an anti-Jewish and anti-Semitic populist attitude. It turns out that the, most of the people who support Jeremy Corbyn think anti-Semitism is a good thing. Such is the amnesia of European history that they suffer from. Uh, Welby responded to the letter. What, what was the response? Or did anybody read it? <laughs> <laughs> well, Welby's response was uh, a lukewarm support for the rap, for the chief rabbi, but I, I'm offering an he supported the chief rabbi. That's sure. the fact. But my yeah, opinion he was that he was almost dragged into doing this. It yeah, wasn't it was. well, not only, It wasn't. Yeah, but it was as I read it. He he wrote it extremely carefully. Uh, it was like. He was in the, the the form of I'm I'm sorry if you found yourself offended, you know that that kind of 
letter. Um, I, I'm sorry that a culture of anti-Semitism appears to have arisen. Uh, instead of holding people accountable for it, uh, or standing behind the Jews with all the passion that Christians ought to, uh, he he simply lamented the fact that it would it had become a social issue, which is so far below what was called for or good enough. Hmm. Hmm. Who's the bell toe for? Oh, oh all right. So, <clears throat> guys, it has been Not a great my bell show. For once. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, I'm back from vacation, so I'm I'm operating at ten percent because once you go on vacation for two weeks. You need a vacation to recover uh, or a long nap or I think this is my third or fourth cup of coffee. Oh, guess who's playing tonight on Monday Night Football? I know they want your support. I do. So, uh, guys, thank you so much for your, your uh, great show. We're going to meet, hopefully, now, Gavin, we're going to do schedules here on the air. You're busy Friday? I have a, I've got a friend's funeral on Friday, okay. which, I, which means I'm taken up during a normal time. Thursday? So I can't do Friday uh, with difficulty. <laughs> so Gavin says he's available Thursday. George, you're get going back from St. Bart's to wonderful Lacanto, Florida. Uh, will you be ready for Thursday? I'll physically be alive <laughs> and in Florida on Thursday. But if the, uh, but yes, I should be okay on Thursday at some time. Ladies and gentlemen, we look forward to seeing you Thursday. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 554, which is 100 years after when St. Augustine was born in 454, which is how I think I'm remembering it, of Anglican unscripted. <laughs> <laughs>